All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Going Live today. Uh, we are joined today with very special guests, Brian Sutton, Sierra Hull, and Guthrie Trapp. And uh, thanks to everyone out there joining us from wherever you're tuning in today. Uh, we're going to be taking some, some questions later. And uh, if you want to go ahead and drop a comment, let us know where you're tuning in from today. Uh, let's just bring everybody in here now. Hello and welcome, everybody. Hey. Hey, hey, how are you doing? Hey there. All right. It's so, like old times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a familiar look. It's been a yeah. while. Uh, yeah. Good to see you, go you guys. Yeah, um, you too, Marcus. You too. What do you guys think about kicking it off with some music here? All right, let's do it. I'll dive in. I'll, I'll, I've been voluntold that I should go first. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's a tune that I've uh, been a fan of for a long time that I first heard. Uh, I think Don Reno and Red Smiley do it. Bill Monroe has a cut of it. It's a big one in the world of bluegrass, but not necessarily the most uh, kind of uh, standard of, of jam favorites, but uh, it's a fun one to do. And uh, one of the first... Uh, evidences of uh, lead guitar in bluegrass from uh, from Don Reno. Here's the old song, uh, The Lonesome Wind Blues. <laughs> fun to be singing solo in the basement again <laughs> <laughs> fantastic well, what do you think sierra do you want to kick us off with some more music Keep this sure going? 
Sure. Well, I was just thinking, you know, I guess of, of the three of us, I'm kind of the newest uh, to artist works here. And it was August of last year when my course kicked off. So I'm sort of coming up around a year, I guess, of having done this. So I thought maybe I'd just choose a tune from the site. Um, this is one we always try to put up monthly messages and things and sometimes add new tunes in there. And so this is one uh, a lot of my students have been playing lately. And I thought I'd play this one because um, it was one of those tunes that I first learned from a great resource that I had growing up called uh, 30 Fiddle Tunes for the Mandolin, uh, an instructional book by a guy named Butch Baldessari, a great player. And I learned so much from that book. And um, this was one of those tunes. And of course, you know, in the jam circle is more known these days, but this is one I recently put up as a monthly message for folks have been playing. So this is called the Chickapin Hunting. always nice. a good one beautiful thanks yeah i've always liked that one very nice all right guthrie now marcus are you getting like questions or anything from anybody or no yeah actually why don't you play something for the folks watching and then we'll check in and say hi there's a lot of people dropping in their locations where they're tuning in from so we'll we'll check in with the crowd in just a minute here but uh why don't we give them some music in the meantime we need guthrie, to hear you guthrie yeah yeah hey I, I just want to say i'm i'm so happy to be a part of this bluegrass live stream <laughs> um, you're, you're, a, you're an honorary I, member i'm Always kidding i mean I, you know i'm i'm here i'm of course once again I'm, I'm like you know here we go with this Thank mm -hmm. you. 
right. Masterful. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Oh, man. Thank you, guys. I, you know, I keep hearing so, – it's just so funny. As soon as we start doing this, it sounds like somebody is scraping – through my wall trying to get into this room <laughs> this, i mean my house is only five years old and it's like i, I hope there's not like a squirrel in my wall or something it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. i hear, keep hearing this of course right when we're doing a live stream i'm hearing this like scratching like a raccoon's about to burst through the through the wall over here <laughs> it's always something man yeah. <laughs> right on well do you guys want to say hello to some of our viewers here we got people checking in from all over the place i'm gonna just throw a couple up here on the screen all right thomas checking thomas. in from new jersey well howdy howdy thomas welcome to nashville hey i think that's one of my students out there brianne <laughs> we got all right in the uk uk what is it about Love uh it. one o'clock in the morning over there <laughs> In the midnight, we're covered in Hawaii. Yeah. Hawaii, wow, Aloha. <laughs> Arizona. Nice. Hey there, Debbie. Oh, Julie. Hey, Julie. Hi. Welcome back. Man, lots of overseas. New Hampshire, Bay Area. Nice. Some South Carolina, Southern California. Awesome. Placerville, right on. Rusty Banjo. <laughs> <laughs> Auburn, Maine. All right. Hello Re out there in Spain. Recognize some of these folks. Barcelona. <laughs> All right. Nice. Mesquite. All right. Mike out in Montana. Hey, Mike. Hey. I was just out there. Beautiful. <laughs> Washington. Kentucky. Nice. Just up the street. Got another Washington here. Hi, Mertz. Cool. In Germany. We have many more of these, so yeah. welcome everyone wherever welcome. you're tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good uh, Friday hang. It's this is fun. Um, yeah. What have you been doing, Guthrie? Well, um, I've been you know doing all the teaching stuff that that we do and. Um, me and Oates have been doing some duo stuff. I've been working with uh, Uncle Larry. We've been recording a few songs over yeah, here. Yeah, what are some pictures of that? What were you working on? We just, you know, we did that live thing with Brett Papa, and we got mm -hmm. some good feedback, and and we were like, man, let's just, you know, let's go cut a few of these ideas. And so we recorded three things right up the street here with Brandon Bell, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, we we liked it, and and uh, we're gonna cut some more. Probably release a little a little EP or something. And, you know, he's got such a good YouTube thing going. And so, you know, yeah, he's, he's got some, he's, he's gone worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, uncle Larry Sierra? You I know don't. Talking about? I don't tell me. Well, it's actually Tom Bukovac, uh, lovely fella from Cleveland, great electric guitar player, does a lot of sessions in Nashville is currently touring with Ann Wilson out and around the world and just a goofy, but I've really, heard, I've heard his name. Yeah. Really talented I, I, I guy. And, yeah. And just really yeah. good, really good dude. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I saw you guys doing some stuff and <clears throat> yeah, I worked with him what, yesterday or day before. No, it was yesterday. Yeah. You're a frequent uh, guest on the uh, homeschooling. I've channel. been captured, been captured <laughs> by the camera. When you see so, him yes. coming at you with his phone, he's you're, you're kind of, okay. You're the right. next victim on. Right. On right. So that's been fun. I mean, because me and him are, you know, we're kind of, kind of coming from two totally different backgrounds. And so that seems to line up pretty well. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, just, you know, not really, I don't really tour. I'm, my goal is to get this trio out and start working. I've been loving playing with this trio, just electric mm -hmm. guitar, bass and drums. We do, I do every Monday night here and then I do Rudy's jazz room and some things like that. And so, you know, just continuing to, uh, to rock on here. Great. I need to come out and see you guys. I, I, one of my goals is to, you know, go out and see some more live stuff in Nashville. It's just been so, I feel so unplugged with the jam scene and the live stuff. Yeah. When I used to be in it, you know, I was playing all the time at Station Inn or, you know, Third Line or somewhere like that. But uh, anyway, yeah. I'll, come, did out, you I'll guys, come out and catch them. Did you guys go to Casey's Red Shoe Jam the other night? Mm -mm. No, no we should have. We talked about it and then we, we, 
I got in grandma mode, I guess, you know, didn't make yeah. it out. So <laughs> I wanted to make it out. It's, I, I love those. So talk about getting a good dose of seeing everybody. And yeah. And you Nashville, know, yeah, for, for folks that don't live here, I mean, Nashville really is one of the best music communities. You know, we, we do see people rarely, but when we do see each other, it's so good. And, and, you know, I see people more in the airport. It seems like a lot of times than I do it at jam sessions and shows, but still it's, it just reminds you that we're all here and, and again, certainly these days, it's good to just connect with people, which I've been connecting with you, Sierra, way too much. Maybe we've been playing. What do playing you a mean, Brian? I've maybe been I'm... loving. I've been loving it on my end. So <laughs> I'm not tired. Sorry, the full end's not mutual, but you yeah. know, I've been having a great time getting to hang and play music with you this year. So, <laughs> hey Guthrie, when we're out touring with Bela Fleck and and Sierra's not in the room, you know, there's there's a certain vibe, right? <laughs> And then, and then it's like, okay, here comes the perk factor. And, you know, right. Sierra, Sierra's <laughs> second way. That's awesome. Man, you know, for... for we judge it by the perk levels, yeah. Perk <laughs> levels, got to keep them high. <laughs> it's, a, it's such a good point that I always I try to bring up to people that, that don't have a chance to ever visit this city. And I've been here about 22 years and it's... And I live in town, you know, I'm, there's, I'm in the thick of it here in East Nashville. And, and um, the beautiful thing about this this place to me is that it is for there's a lot to it but it is very condensed and so all these other music cities like that you you know of course these people are moving here now in droves as we know but you know in the in 20 years ago you had an option of going to to really have a career in music it's la new york nashville for the most part well you've got the two biggest cities in the country and then you've got this little town in tennessee for, you know compared to those two that wasn't an option for me. So I came to Nashville and because all of my heroes that I grew up listening to records on Sam Bush and, and Jerry Douglas and all those guys that my parents listened to, this was an obvious place to go, to go. But the more you're here, you realize that it is, it's, it's this amazing condensed uh, community of musicians to where Ellie and New York are, there's tons of amazing musicians there, but it's so fragmented, diluted with, you know, 20 million people walking around. Yeah. And so to, to leave my house and go to the coffee shop five minutes down the, the road or less and see, you know, on any given day, uh, Robin Ford, David Greer, you know, and, 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 uh, and that's, you know, and then from there on, but, you know, just some of our favorite musicians on the planet, not only do we see them on a regular basis, but they live in our neighborhood and they're part of our daily lives. You know, it's pretty yeah. incredible. And just the fact you can put Robin Ford and David Greer, in the same in the same sentence is pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So Sierra and I have been hitting the road a lot this uh, spring and summer with Bela Flex Bluegrass Heart Project. But you were you were just out back out with your band, killing it, right? You were you're I think the last been, time I saw you was a month ago or so. Yeah, it's been busy. So you know, I'm obviously kind of like you. I'm doing as many of the Bela shows as I can. Not all of them. I know. There's some you're not on. There's some I'm not on a lot that we're on together. Um, so, yeah, I did, I guess, about three, three and a half weeks or three weeks-ish with the mm -hmm. Bluegrass Heart stuff with you guys. And then went home for about a day and then went back out for about another three and a half weeks with my band and crossed into you guys for a second at the old Gray Fox Festival. Yeah, and I, it was true. weird because that was the first time I had seen the show not being on the show. Yeah, I wonder so, about that. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously, I got to play with you guys and and sit in on a few at the end, but but it was really kind of wild having just got off that tour to like leave, show up at this festival, and it's like, hey, well, there's my husband for one, Justin. He's mm -hmm. also in the band. But then I felt like it was weird. I'd look over and I'd see all the Bluegrass Heart crew, and then I'd see all my band, and I'm like, going, this is funny. I don't know who I'm on <laughs> tour with right now. <laughs> That's the problem. I kind of felt like, am I not supposed to be leaving with you guys? What is this? Where are you guys going? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but no, it was great to get to hear the show and, you know, just kind of be a fan of the music there. Yeah. Awesome. You no, know, Guthrie probably, you, you and I have similar feelings watching the uh, various iterations of the Jerry Douglas band over the last several years. You and I were both privileged yeah. to be part of the, all that music. And it's, it is fun. We were just doing a run with, with Sam and Jerry and their respective bands uh, after Telluride and, and just great to hear Mike Seal play guitar with, yeah. and all that stuff. And it was great to hear you play that. And I, you know, of course, privileged to play all that stuff with Jerry for those years. But it's, it's cool to hear how music, how the same music played with different people, you know, kind of, you know, keeps, keeps it alive, keeps it real energetic, 
you know, I think that's a lot of to kind of dip this back into, you know, artist works kind of chat here as far as just just the kind of stuff that I know that we all teach. You know, it's really about not just getting your fingers in the right spot, but this kind of music that we love and, and enjoy music with people and, and being around people. And again, uh, creating community and stuff like that. That's really, you know, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And, and the festivals, again, just just it's just fun. It's fun to talk about it, fun to be a part of it. It is. It's a total blast. And man, what an what a, a amazingly unique uh, approach to the guitar and that music that Mike Seal brought yeah. in. I mean, really, really refreshing and cool. Yeah, I, I would watch their set pretty much every night of this tour and just just loved it. And then I, you know, he and I got into some jams, <clears throat> you know, before some of the shows in the afternoon and just had a blast. And it was great to be here. I hadn't been around him all that much. So it was great just to kind of hang with him and, and talk about Jerry Reed and share oh, YouTube videos and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing that makes me think about that that might be helpful to some of these students is, you know, I learned a lot from Jerry because, and, you know, him going out there and pushing the envelope in his, in his band with his original music and pushing it to the level of almost falling off the cliff and then bring it coming, coming right back, pushing, pushing, pushing. And it didn't matter if we were opening up for Paul Simon or if we were playing for 20 people it was the same energy that we, that, I mean, that's kind of what we do as lifers. We, we yeah. you know, when we pick up the instrument, it's 150%. It doesn't matter. And so with him, I learned, Hey, you know, it's okay to, to push it, push the envelope and make a mistake. But the thing that's cool about that, that people might not realize is when you have your own band and, and you're not backing up Allison Krauss, it's okay to do that. And it's a different thing. So, you know, for me to go out and play with my little trio, I'm making mistakes and falling all over the place, but I, that's okay because that, that music, that's our outlet to be able to do that. But if I'm playing with Sean Camp or Oates or somebody like that, where I'm playing their songs, then it's a totally different dynamic. And I'm, I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to, I'm trying to try not to overplay. And so, I mean, this is, might seem obvious to some people, but I mean, that's kind of something that I, that kind of changed my life. I mean, those two things, you know, knowing kind of what to do and what not to do, but also even more was the fact that it's okay to take chances in that, in that setting versus yeah. the other setting might be a little more, more tamed, tamed back. I know there's kind of two different points there, but you get what I'm saying. Well, I mean, all three of us do our own thing to a degree and also do a lot of side person stuff, right? We're more the service industry, industry side of things, but, uh, um, I like that balance. I, I I dig the fact that I can continue to try to write music and, and think about what I want to say, but, you know, I just always look for this balance of, of when I get to play somebody else's tunes, you know, what can I, to your point, like, what can I bring into that that kind of keeps it exciting and vulnerable and, and not mm -hmm. too, not too stale, you know, like you don't, as a side man, you don't want to be too safe, like you say, right. You know, and, and provide energy. That's one of the great things about playing this Bela music with, Sierra out there is that, you know, it's just, we inspire each other on stage every night. And that's, that's ends up being what it's about when you're in a team like that. And even if my part is not to be the, the front man, I can still, you know, be inspired by whatever's going on. And then every show is kind of different, even though we're playing the same material always feels different because we're really listening and we're really kind of paying attention to the moment. And that's really cool stuff to get into out. I mean, that big picture of just, you know, you've done the work, you trust, you trust, that you know it and then you just try to have the most musical time you can with it. Yeah. H how That's did you point. guys, how did you guys, um, how, how do you look at what were some life changing things as far as learning your instrument when you were younger? And I'll give you just, I'll give you an example and then I'm going to shut up. But when I was stuck playing on the first, you know, three or four frets uh, on an acoustic guitar, a couple pentatonics here and there, but totally lost up the fingerboard completely lost. Uh, I watched a video um, and I learned, okay, this person said, if you want to unlock the fingerboard up the neck, you've got to learn what people are now calling the cage system of, you know, your chord inversions up the neck and all the information around those chords. And so as soon as I got into that, it completely changed my entire life on the guitar and gave me a whatever foundation I have now to, kind of fall back on 
uh, at least muscle memory and getting your hands together was that. And then the other part, of course, you know, 98% of it is listening and hearing what you're doing, but that was a life changing thing for me when I was a kid. What, how did you guys, what, what were some of those things for y'all? Go Sierra. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I don't know that I would just point it to like one specific thing, but I know there was a few records for me that I really kind of obsessed over. And I, I mean, more than a few, but um, I think for me, I always try to tell people to like, find something that you're really inspired to sit down and learn. Um, because I know, you know, all the practice stuff, trying to learn, you know, all your scales and chords and things like that. Of course, we want to dive into all that as much as possible. But I also think for me, I was always really inspired to actually sit down and sort of do a deep dive into a lot of the records I love. So, you know, there was some Alison Krauss records I love, some, you know, um, take an album like Not All Who Wonder Are Lost, a Chris Thiele album, you know, where I literally sit, sat down and tried to learn note for note the way you know, these players would play stuff, take a, a David, David Grisman project or things like that, where I feel like um, really taking one record and, you know, I would encourage musicians to do that. If there's something that you just really love that, you know, you're not going to get tired of sitting down with because you just love that music so much to really do a deep dive into that project. Um, try to learn, you know, for me, it wasn't just about learning the mandolin solos. You know, I learned, uh, I'm sure, you know, I'm the record I'm talking about, not who, not all who wonder or lost that particular one. Brian's on, he's the guitarist. So I know I've learned some Brian solos on the mandolin from just loving, you know, the, the solos he played on that record or other projects. Um, and so, you know, not just trying to learn mandolin stuff, but trying to just take, you know, maybe a Stuart Duncan solo I loved or a Jerry Douglas solo and trying to to dive in and learn that. Um, because I think as a listener, I just appreciated that music so much that it was already kind of inside me in a way um, that it, it felt like a natural progression to sort of sit down and try to learn that on the instrument. So I think once I started doing that and sort of taking a few projects that, you know, I could really get inside, um, not just kind of surface level, but also thinking about how these players played rhythm, the dynamics of the whole band playing together and really kind of studying that um, was super helpful for me. Mm. That's great. Yeah. I, you know, one of the, you talk about like a specific instance and I can remember our little family band that we had uh, made some recordings. We made a little record back when I was in high school, uh, maybe even late middle school, maybe I was 14 or 15. And I remember listening back to it. Um, and it just didn't sound like, I thought that I sounded <laughs> uh, and the point that I realized at the time was compared to like, I would, you know, that was, I'd, I'd just gotten the Mark Markology record and was listening to Jack Lawrence uh, who was out touring with, with Doc Watson and of course, Tony and all these players and just every note that they played just sounded important. It was less about kind of cool licks and, and anything like that, but it's more just like, what kind of sound are these people creating and what, what am I not doing? Because it, you know, in comparison, I, you know, I could kind of hear elements of that, but it just didn't feel clean. It didn't feel, uh, did just didn't feel like it had the same kind of impact. And it really, that was an, a really a, an initiator for me to go down this path of trying to understand that a little more as far as mechanics and tone of the instrument. You know, that's the thing about bluegrass guitar is that it, it really is the, the quietest instrument uh, in most jam sessions, uh, unless you're working with great musicians like Sierra who are sensitive and, and can listen and react. But, but in a bluegrass jam, it's, you know, you're always kind of fighting, playing too hard and things like that. And so, but that was the really kind of key thing, just listening to that, listen to that playback and going, well, that's, that's not what I, what I really want to sound like. And what, but what, what do I want to sound like? Cause again, I had these examples to go to and just, you know, to this day, you know, I'm still thinking about, how can I optimize me or, and, or maximize or optimize this guitar and things like that from a tonal or, or like tension management perspective, which goes into a lot of, if not most of what I kind of bring as a teacher of this guitar style is, is, you know, it is acoustic. It's you, it's this instrument. And how can you again, optimize yourself and, and optimize the instrument to make the best sound that you can make we're all going to sound different, but I think that we can all sound like the best version of ourselves. Um, but it started 
you know, I remember in my living room listening to that recording and going, wow, this is, there's some work to be done here. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's awesome about knowing, knowing a little bit about bluegrass and a little, very little about jazz, but the, but, but the, the thing that's amazing to me, another thing that some people might not think about because they think bluegrass is very simple, three chords, and then jazz is very complex, you know, crazy stuff. Well, it's interesting because these two genres of music to me are, and I'm talking about being able to go anywhere in the world and sit and play with, with people and have that vocabulary. There's not many genres of music where you can do that unless you're singing songs, but you know, to have, a, uh, a, a, they're very similar in, in styles to me to where you have a head or a melody, and then you're improvising on uh, a solo and, and that combined with, you know, like I said, if you go anywhere in the world and you say, Hey, do you guys know red haired boy or salt Creek or whatever, they're going to know it. And you're going to be able to, even if you can't speak their language, you're going to sit in a room with five guys and you're going to be able to play about 10 or 15 songs together, you know, and jazz is the same way. And it's it, what my point of that is, is if you can find a community of musicians in your local area that you can start playing with, especially in the bluegrass and, and those uh, genres, because there are these kind of um, foundation, you know, a group of songs that you have standards. Um, that to me was a huge thing too. coming home after school and being able to play guitar with my uncle in the same room and holding yourself accountable for, uh, timing and, and not different than playing with a metronome, but playing with another human being and, and a group of people to where you go to a bluegrass festival, the hot pickers are in the inner circle. And then the, the rings of the circle going outward are the guys that might be in the inner circle next year. And then they got kids on the way outskirts that are just learning to play their chords. So to me, man, that was such an amazing way to kind of jump in and maybe even speed up the process a little bit because you're, you're kind of having to jump in there and it's in a, in a very cool environment. You're either at a bluegrass festival or you're at somebody's house party. And man, I just always say, if you can get into playing with other musicians in your, in your neighborhood, if it's a coffee shop or a local jam session or whatever, man, do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Um, Marcus. <laughs> hey, hey. Marcus, tell us what to do. The <laughs> well, hey, aren't we uh, aren't we giving away some prizes? Yeah, yeah. we got some fancy prizes. Yeah, up in here? so to everyone watching today, we've got a giveaway going. Um, if you check in the description for the event page today, you'll see some links there, and uh, there's a little reminder oh, just yeah. look below the player. Um, Sierra's giving away there. her mandolin, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> But uh, yeah, some really good swag today, some signed stuff from all of these guys, and um, there'll be some uh, free memberships for ArtistWorks online lessons and some ArtistWorks swag as well. So definitely check that yeah. out. Cool. Fantastic. You want to hit some questions or, so, or play again? You want to go to another round, play something? Yeah, let's do some more music if you guys are up for it. Uh, Sierra, why don't you kick it off? Hmm. Well, is there anything that people would want to hear out there? Oh yeah, we Who? got a direct line for them. We could we could see if there's anything that they'd like to hear. Sure. Yeah. How about somebody post a request for Sierra in the comments. In the meantime, I wanted to ask about your Washburn, Brian. Oh yeah, the Washburn. Uh, well, trying to make a long story short, there was, you know, back in the like 19 coming out of the 20s into the third, uh, certainly the 1930s in America, um, a lot of guitars made out of factories in Chicago, and also, brands were kind of interchangeable. Gibson kind of owned a couple of different brands and would make guitars in the Gibson factory uh, with other labels on them. Regal would make a lot of guitars for various people. Uh, but Tonk Brothers was, I think they were piano makers, you know, back in this day, and but produced a line of guitars. And I think this one was actually made in the Regal factory, but Tonk Brothers owned the Washburn name. So it has a Washburn headstock on it but it's um it's mid 30s uh solid mahogany back and sides and an x brace spruce top and so as far as for anybody that's into again kind of that classic era of acoustic guitars again the 30s martins and the 30s gibsons these are kind of 
guitars of that same era with the same kind of quality of build. They just don't say Martin or Gibson on and they say Washburn or they'll say uh, Master Tone or they'll say Regal or whatever it's going to say on it. Um, but it's just such a, a punchy guitar. It's real. If anybody's ever played some of these kind of Roy Smet guitars or the, uh, or the radio specials or something like that. Um, it's just a barker. That's what this thing does. And it's got this really cool, uh, you know, decal on it. And, and it's just, you don't see these things every day, but they're just, they're really fun to play. They've got a great voice about them. Real, real, real prominent mid range, real warm, uh, chunky mid range. And so, uh, that's what it is. <laughs> five, two, five, seven, Washburn, five, two, five, seven for Tonk brothers. Wow. Brian, do you use that in the studio very often? That guitar? Uh, I have, I just got it. It's probably about a month or six weeks ago. So I'm still just kind of getting used to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I generally go with, you know, I got the whole cartridge rig with a lot of the staples that I need, but I'll generally carry a few things, a few oddballs here and there. I've got a couple of other, Epiphone is another uh, name that I really like as far as these kind of uh, off the radar guitars. And I use one of those all the time. I got this little mahogany guitar from 1929 that, that goes <clears throat> goes everywhere with me, but I could see this one getting used more and more. What a great sound of guitar and everything about it is unique the pick guard the bridge the yeah. headstock it's all it's a it's different. a look yeah it's cool that's half the battle right yeah you totally got a i was cool. i was smitten by the decal <laughs> <laughs> all right well we did get a whole lot of requests i, for I saw a here. lot yeah. of those coming in <laughs> so i clicked over there <laughs> some great options here what, what not if you can see that Okay, we'll get to some questions after this pretty soon. Yeah, let's well. do that. Well, I tell you what, the last one I see here, um, while we're talking about stuff on the site, um, and somebody also, a few people were saying, play a Monroe tune. Mm. One of uh, one of my favorite Monroe tunes that I learned um, when I was a kid is a tune called Bluegrass Stomp, which, you know, is the, the cool thing about a lot of these tunes is that, um, and, and, you know, take a, a course like Brian's where he teaches all these different kind of songs at different levels. You can actually, you know, take a, a song like this one, Bluegrass Stomp, which is essentially just a blues and play it super simple, or you can get as advanced with it as you want. Um, and so I've always loved this one just because on the surface, it's a simple tune, but it's one that really allows a lot of room for improvisation. Um, it uses the sort of row downstrokes. Here, let me get that right hand in there. That kind of a thing as well. So this is the bluegrass stomp.
that. <laughs> awesome. Oh man, thanks. Beautiful. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> I don't want to follow that, Guthrie. I think you should. No, oh, whatever. <laughs> it's like, I wish we were here to play together. You know? I know. What is this? Sitting in our own rooms. <laughs> well, we couldn't do that. We, could, You know, that was, as you say, it was just a, a blues in the key of D. I don't know. Guthrie's got something else worked up that you could, you know, do that a true. Crap version of, of a blues in D. I don't know. Yeah. Throwing it out gonna, there. One of the, you know, um, a buddy of mine just sent me, one of my students just sent me this, this, uh, piece of technology that is is you're able to play along with with people online in real time or for i haven't tried it yet but maybe it works and we'll see what we can do maybe we can use that sometime but i don't know Ooh. i'll play a little piece of something here that I, none of this is this is all hard to do on my solo act is not i'm no chet atkins you know what i mean yeah but um there's a little piece of a little something here Thanks. Yeah. Mm. I was looking through this. Yeah, man. I see Billy in the low ground. That feels like a good one I should play today on the old Washburn. Yeah. Somebody just saying Wildwood Flower. Okay, let's do both of those. This is a great guitar for Wildwood Flower. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, hey, how about we get to some questions from the audience? You guys up for that? Let's do sure. it. Cool. So I've got an interesting one here that applies to all of you. And just for a little bit of historical context, Brian, I think you've been with us going on 12 years now. Uh, and Guthrie, yeah. you've been with us for about seven years now, I believe. Almost 10. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Get it up there. <laughs> and Sierra, yeah. as one of our newer faculty, you're, go you're going on a year now as well, I believe, right? Almost, yeah. I think awesome. it's coming right up. Well, here's the question. As teachers, what has been the most surprising or unexpected moment or aspect of your time on ArtistWorks? I'll start as the uh, <laughs> well, relative veteran. The old, veteran. Uh, the old veteran says, I, I got into this understanding that what I feel or what I felt, what I currently feel, still feel is the most sort of important stuff to me that I would like to relay to people. I want to teach just like I, as a musician, as an artist, I want to be honest with myself. I feel like that's the best portrayal of anything I do musically is whatever's the most honest. And that, again, invited into the sort of teaching realm when I jumped into the artist works, that for me is, like I said earlier, helping people kind of come to a deeper understanding of their own mechanics, not me trying to teach here's the way I play it. Therefore you should play it. But I recognize a certain kind of challenge in through any kind of format that wasn't, you know, one-on-one -on -one in real time that the kind of discussions that we would have and the things that we would talk about are tricky uh, just because it is a, an, a, about a very personal kind of uh, physical experience, really. I mean, your mechanics are your mechanics. I can't feel your tension. Um, but, being able to know that that even in this format and especially and because of some of the great conversations we've had and the fact that the ve's continue to kind of uh, accrue in the video exchange library um to see it actually work <laughs> not that i was necessarily surprised that that the concept of work but just me teaching it and me talking about it this way it was good for me to have to to think about the best way to talk about it and and feel like I could present this kind of uh, kind of message or kind of thought or kind of uh, avenue into, you know, guitar teaching that was more than just let's put our fingers here and just do it till we've got it memorized. But we, we go deep. We go into these, you know, uh, deeper discussions about tone and, and tension and things like that. And to, and to see, so all that to say, to see, uh, to see people really react to it and, and, and hear back from students that, Hey, I, you know, I went to a jam that was one of the best bits of early feedback I got was uh, a fellow went to his local jam session and people swore he had a new guitar because he just sounded better. And that's, again, that's always been part of my passion as a teacher is I don't want to teach you anything new, but I do want to help you play everything that you already play just better. Um, and that's, again, that's hard to do. Um, but that's what I feel strongly about. So to, to, so to see that happen, has been really rewarding. Uh, again, I don't want to necessarily say surprising, but it was it was it was somewhat surprising to say, yeah, that's, it's working. It's okay. It's gonna it's gonna be all right." <laughs> Same question. If <says>. yeah, <laughs> you you want to go, Sierra? Uh oh, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. Do you do yep. you want to go? Sorry, I think my computer froze for a minute. Um. Well, I don't have a big thing to say. I was just going to say real quick that just in the same vein as what he's saying is that um, I also think that, you know, diving into, yes, the mechanics of everything and, and trying to help people 
play what they already know better, but also just like on an emotional level, like realizing, and I know Brian, you dive into a lot of that on your course too. We've had a lot of discussions about that on the bus or whatever, but just like about how people feel about the, the vulnerability that it takes to sit down and record a video and to send it in and to have all the other students see it and kind of to recognize the network, at least, um, from what I've seen so far, like even this past week had a video where this, you know, lady kind of had a, a bit of an experience plan for somebody and just she felt really awkward afterwards and, and was kind of bummed out about it. And and I think to recognize that so many people feel that way and just to have like a, a community of encouraging people that kind of share like minded feelings toward the process of learning, because learning to play is a very vulnerable thing. It's not like you just snap your fingers and you get better at it. It takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of emotional effort to kind of put yourself out there and to be willing to, in some ways, not sound good for a while until you, you know, kind of dive in and trust that you're getting better, even when it feels like a slow process. And I don't know, I've just, I've really enjoyed the um, community and the spirit that it, I feel like at least that I've experienced so far on this course. And that's been one of my favorite parts about it is just seeing everybody kind of cheering each other on and having sort of a, a like-minded team of people that can all learn together. It's really cool. Um, you know, I'll say this, I, I had no idea that I was going to learn so much, you know, I mean, and what I mean by that is <clears throat> I've always kind of been a seat of the pants player and things just evolved kind of, you know, naturally over time. I never really had to go back and look at and dissect all the things that I was doing, you know, 35 years ago and put that into a curriculum. So that right there was a huge uh, learning experience for me, just having to put all these techniques and things that we've, you know, developed over a long period of time as, as musicians and having to go back and really dissect it and go, okay, what am I really doing here? You know, and go back and really kind of, you know, dig that stuff up. I learned, I learned a lot. I think this has made me teaching has made me personally a much better player. I mean, you know, having to break all this stuff down and find creative and new ways constantly to, to, you know, expedite the process of explaining this stuff. And so I had no idea that, that, you know, you go into it thinking you're going to teach everybody else, but man, I've learned as much or more than anybody uh, along the way here. So th th I, that's, and seeing a lot of progress and the community and people coming to Nashville and, and uh, end up, you know, going out with them and hearing music and you're making some lifelong friends along the way too. So it's been pretty incredible. <clears throat> Next. <Love> <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah. There's a ton of great questions here coming in. Um, we're unfortunately not going to be able to get to all of them, but um, a couple of these that apply to everyone um, coming in, such as uh, how do you all stay motivated as a player? Any advice for that? Uh, I continue to listen to a lot of music um, and just the overall feeling that we get. I think, you know, the, the feeling you get from doing this when you're a little kid and I don't, I, I, I can tell you exactly where I was the first time it really gave me goosebumps. And once that gets in you, I, I don't think, I, I don't think, you know, I call us lifers. We're lifer musicians. It's not a choice. We didn't, you know, this has been going on for so long that, that we're in it for life. There's no, there's no dipping your toe in and, and dipping it out. We're here to stay. And so I think once that feeling becomes, you know, it, it, this becomes part of you, then I don't, I don't know. I've never gotten burned out where I didn't want to listen to music or pick up a, a guitar. I mean, I've, we've all been exhausted, but you know, that doesn't happen. I, I continue to love listening to music. I love to go out and support it. And, and uh, I love to hear it live. I, I love to listen to tons of different kinds of music. I love to listen to music in the car. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my, my take on that. That's yeah. I, I would say for me, it is the fact that I, I mean, since I was a teenager, I've enjoyed listening. I've enjoyed playing as many different kinds of music as I could get my hands or ears on and, and really love it. I mean, I'm just, I think as I'm motivated as a music fan, that motivates me as a player. I mean, to the literal point, I'm, you know, headed up to see Metallica in a couple of days in Pittsburgh. 
and can't wait. <laughs> and <laughs> and took my daughter to see Adrian Ballou here the other night in, in Nashville and listened to a lot of, you know, like solo classical piano in the car, just diving into that repertoire. And anyway, not trying to like, you know, brag about any of that necessarily stuff, but just to, what that keeps me motivated is the fact that there's so much amazing stuff out there. I think as soon as you start kind of defining, well, this is what I like and don't like, I think everything has something to teach you uh, or to insp or somehow inspire you as a listener or and then as a musician, uh, you know, to listen to some of the great traditional music from India and Brazil and other parts of the world. I mean, it's just so much out there. And, and the fact that you'll never hear it all and, it's, and there's so much stuff. I mean, that's just uh, that's the thing for me is just that I, I'm inspired as I listen to so many different things. I agree with all that. And I would also just say, you know, if you can try to always surround yourself with musicians and people that are better than you, you're always going to learn and be motivated by that. And I think for me, that's still true. You know, sometimes I look up and I'm like, you know, I'm definitely the weakest link here. And that's, that's, you know, a scary feeling sometimes, but it's a good thing because you learn a lot when you surround yourself by people who are, you know, going to bring out the best in you and kind of make you keep pushing to try to be better, you know. I also want to add the fact that I think this is really important um, and, and able to stay motivated and inspired by this, especially when you're learning and this is a new thing for you. I think it's really important to don't don't forget that this is supposed to be fun for you. You know, it, if you've got a career and, and you're, you know, in your 50s and 60s and you know you're not going to be a professional musician, this should this should never be. This should never be something that's aggravating or, or stuff. This should be something that you really look forward to doing in your spare time. And to add to that also, don't feel like you have to learn something just because somebody else told you you need to. If you don't enjoy the music, don't learn it. Find something that you really, really love and focus on learning that. That's what you're going to excel at anyway, because you really love it. Um and I've found that through my own personal thing. If somebody calls me to play an 80 eighties rock guitar solo, I'm going to tell them that they've, they've called the wrong person because I didn't listen to that music. So we're all going to excel t to me th th at the things that we really, really love. And so, you know, keep it simple. Don't try to transcribe a, f a whole uh, Oscar Peterson or West Montgomery guitar solo. N find some beauty in the fact that there is, you know, amazing music with really simple melodies and really simple things. So keep that in mind. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Take little bitty bites here and let it be fun and just let, enjoy the process. So that's my spiel because I, I'm having to do that on my own, you know? Amen to that. <laughs> hey, actually, so that, that's like your vertigo lick, Brian. It is. It yeah, Brian actually it. quoted some Metallica basically in, oh, yeah. in, in Vertigo on yeah, the Bailey Flex record. And every Park. time it's, I love that part of the song. That's, in a, that's on the Bailey Flex record. <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. That He's squeaked a in the one. editing. You're sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, we did a tour with him years ago. We did a little trio with Casey and I would do, you know, his tune Spanish points in E minor. And it's that we usually play, perform it with a big guitar intro. And I, and I, and I, at some point in there, I was, and I got into this thing. You could hear like this kind of Beavis and butthead <laughs> out in the crowd. <laughs> and it was just, it was fun to do that every, uh, every show just to see kind of what the, you could just the subtle little reaction in the crowd. Like he's really doing that. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and, and on that same song on this last tour that we did, um, you know, for anybody that might've seen that show or was listening, we, he had sh uh, shots sneak in oh, yeah. a little, uh, <laughs> Rod Stewart, you know, if you think I'm sexy on his bass solo, you know, <laughs> so lots going on on that vertigo song. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> fun, fun facts. <laughs> Are there, are there other questions? We're getting started. Yeah, actually, I'm thinking, how about some more music? You guys have to play a little more? Sure. Well, okay. Whatever you want. Cool. And just real quick, you had a que uh, someone had asked if you teach that bluegrass stomp in your curriculum. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah that's in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in there. Great. Tis. All righty. Well, who wants to kick it off? Go ahead, Sierra. Right, because me and Brian did too, and oh, I did too. Yeah, she did too. She killed. Oh, you I, did. Oh, oh, I oh, did okay. too as well. 
you know, I'll use Barry Cooper's question here. What are your, what are your individual approaches to efficiently learn a tune? Um, I think for fiddle tunes, I would do something like this where again, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit of knowing all the chapters of the book, but like a classic fiddle tune, um, whiskey before breakfast that if you go YouTube whiskey before breakfast, you're going to hear a thousand different versions. And my advice and what I, what I try to do for myself is ask the question, like, what are the most important notes that make whiskey before breakfast happen or whatever the tune's going to be. So that would sound something like this. That's the A section. in your brain and something that you can sing when you can vocalize it, 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 it helps get it, get the song out from under your fingers, which is always a good thing to do. Uh, then you can kind of play with filling all those spaces. Nice. Cool. Hey, I'll say I'll, I'll add to that question uh, about the songs is, you know, if if I'm going to learn a song, I want to listen to it before I, I want to listen to it a bunch before I even think about picking up the guitar. Well, yeah. KJ says, uh, what's the best method to find just that straight melody? A lot of listening. Yeah, listen. And then so check this out. I, you know, another to add to that kind of same thing is learning. A lot of people get stuck learning the major scale. And they're like, OK, I'm on this this hamster wheel of this major scale. How do I get off of it and start making it sound like music? Well, the first thing you can do and you've got your own tool set with you all the time to be able to do this is write down about five songs that that, that you know that you've known since childhood. You know, the Andy Griffith show. Happy birthday the star spangled banner um you know whatever it is the flintstones anything like that that you know absolutely cold if you heard one note that wasn't right you would know it whether you're a, a great musician or not learn those melodies and start seeing how the major scale works you know it's good advice mm. who's gonna and pick one a, a, another thing i was gonna tell you is this uh um all these fundamentals that at least I teach in my course, which the, the chord shapes and that kind of stuff was a big, a, a big uh, help to me. And so I, I preach that gospel a lot, but um, in, all these fundamentals are applicable to every style of music. I've talked to great jazz players. I've talked to a bunch of guys. A lot of people are looking at this the same way, especially on the guitar. Um, the fundamentals are applicable to every genre of music. It's not just, 
okay, learn this for country. And then if you play funk or rock or reggae or blues or jazz or whatever, it's going to be different. It's all the same thing to me. And so you hear a lot of people go, okay, well, can I use the, I know the A minor pentatonic shape. I can use that on everything. Right. And it's like, well, no, not exactly. So we have to start getting into the differences of, of what music, you know, the difference between, you know, major, minor, dominant seven, major seven, and then it goes from there. But ear, some ear training to really be able to distinguish these sounds in a, in a, in a big way. And then just realize that this is all just music. So it really comes out. Nashville's a town that really makes you aware of, of the song. And so if the song's country, we, we play in a country style. Maybe if it's something, if it's blues or funk or whatever it is, we're going to go in those directions. So it's important not to kind of separate this stuff to me a whole lot. Right. That's my two Neat. cents on that. <laughs> Neat. <It's> a- <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying this because I see, uh, you know, a lot of a lot, we have a lot of students, and I do see some reoccurring uh, things. And uh, what it mainly is for a lot of people is getting those fundamentals of just man, you got to spend a lot of time learning those chord shapes, mapping out triads, seeing how to build these simple chords uh, up and down the neck. And and man, that to me is like a direct uh, rhythm guitar and chords versus single note lead playing to me are not separated. They're the same thing. All this stuff, you you have to have that foundation. Uh, To me, it's just, it's everything. It's a life changer. Yep. Good advice. (laughs) (laughs) All right, next. (laughs) You want to pick some more or answer some more? Sure. Got a couple (laughs) more uh, tune requests. You up for uh, some Lonesome Moonlight Waltz, Sierra? Sure. Yeah, I can do some Lonesome Moonlight Waltz. Um, all right. Let's do that. <laughs> we're keeping it all Artist Works themed here. I'm sure, you, I'm sure Brian probably teaches this one on his course as well, right? Yep. It's one of those standard tunes, also a Bill Monroe tune. Um, mm-hmm. This is, well, fun, fun fact, this is probably the first tune that I ever was paid money <laughs> after I played or to play this tune, I was at a jam. Um, I hadn't been playing very long. I mean, just a few months. And, and I had learned to play a very simple version of this tune when I was gosh, probably like eight years old. And I went to this jam down the road from where I grew up. Um, and it was this old community center and they would have a room in the back where people would kind of hang out and jam and then a little stage out front. And um, they were trying to, t- they heard me play this tune and they said, you know, this group of old fellows, you know, was like, Hey, honey, why don't you get up there and play that on stage? And I said, I don't know. I don't, you know, I think I was trying to be too shy. You know, I was like, I don't think I want to. And some guy, you know, gave me five bucks and another guy laid down $5 and another guy laid, laid down $5. And before you know it, you know, we had about $17 on the line and wow. I felt guilted into uh, playing the loads of moonlight waltz for the good people of Jamestown, Tennessee. <laughs> but needless to say, I came home that night and I woke up my mom who was already in bed. My dad and I were out at the gym together and came back and it was kind of late. And I woke up mom. And I said, mom, I need $17. Tonight. <laughs> so I'll always think of that. But yeah, this is loads of moonlight waltz.
So that was neat. Very nice. Thanks. Beautiful. <laughs> we lose oh, the Guthrie. We lose Mr. Shrek there. Yeah, I think he might be. Uh, he'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, cool. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Uh, I was going to ask Sierra when you go up, back out with Corey Wong. Is that this year? Yeah, that'll be November. Wow, that's fun. Yeah, lot, lots of touring this year. It's been kind of wild. Probably the most, it it will have been the most I've ever been on the road, I think. Just this year, it's kind of just back full force. But a lot of fun things between my, my own stuff and doing the bail stuff with you and getting to do the Corey Wong thing. It's It's all different, so that'll be fun. Yeah, that's cool. And you, or well, I mean, those, he arranges stuff and brings different people in. Is that? Yeah. So the last tour I did, I actually opened the show solo and then his band would join me for a little bit of the, the songs kind of near the end of my set. I just did a short opening set and then I would come back out with them later. They would play two sets of music and I would okay. come back out and play with them. On this tour, I think what we're going to do which will be fun for me um, is I'll be quick. Cause the other tour also had a guest vocalist, Antoine Stanley, who was kind of like the main mm -hmm. guest on, on the second set. So this time I'm just going to be one of the main guests. And so we're actually going to arrange some full, ver full band versions of some of my songs too, oh, which will be kind of fun. So I played with the rhythm section, but it'll be fun to kind of dive in maybe a step further this time and, you know, yeah, cool. get some more of the horn players. I've played a lot with our Eddie Barbash who, um, you know, joined me on, on my portion yeah. of the things last time, but it'll be fun to do some stuff with the full band too. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, what's up? Yeah, what, what else do you guys have upcoming? Where can folks see you? I am I, I'm still doing the, whatever Bela Fleck the, on the bluegrass shows. That's, that's kind of the bulk of my balance of road life um, between now and the end of the year um that's so yeah that's that's pretty much it other than that it's it's projects in nashville just recording sessions here and there cool i'll be at rudy's jazz room tomorrow night at 11 o'clock <laughs> get out there nashville here in nashville beautiful nashville tennessee and then i'm going to germany uh in november with oats being me and john oats have a acoustic duo uh I told John, I said, man, you went from the top grossing duo of all time to the lowest. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Kidding, of course. But we're going to Germany uh, all of November. We're going to every major city in Germany, like 13 shows. And so right. other than that, I'm in town. I love playing at the Underdog, my little uh, local club up the street, Monday nights. And we get guys like Larry Carlton, Billy Gibbons, Joe Bonamassa, Kirk Fletcher, Josh Smith, um, uh, Jack Roosh. Um, you know, killer electric guitar players come and, and hang at this little club. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, in, it's an incredible neighborhood little guitar bar that we have. So I play there every Monday nights, eight to 10 and then hang out in, in town. So Fun. come see me. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'm, I'm home. Uncle Larry, Uncle while. Larry comes and hangs. Sorry. I'm, I'm sure. so sorry. I got, no, I got to come hang out with Uncle Larry now that I know that you got to come see Uncle Larry. Scoop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was just going to tell folks I'm I'm kind of enjoying being home for a minute here. I've got a couple festivals uh, near the end of the month, and then I kind of get crazy busy. I'm doing the Bela tour in September, uh, which I don't think you're on that particular run. I'm on not all of it. Uh, on on all of it, but anyway, then I'm literally hopping from that like the next day from that tour to my tour, um, my fall tour, and doing the Corey Wong tour. So it's probably just best to go to my website to see what's what's up than me to tell you because i don't even know myself hardly yeah, that's <laughs> where what you the do. locations are <laughs> I know. You, have to, you have to log into your own website thank god for master are. tour yeah <laughs> <laughs> i love master tour i mean i'm telling you i'm i was thinking about that today like wow i really like i couldn't even hardly tell you where i'm going and today i yeah. was just kind of looking like okay where, where am i going to be coming up so crazy but maybe i'll see some of you good folks out there Awesome. Well, I guess it's probably a good time as any to uh, to start to wind this down. But uh, just wanted to thank all of you so much for your time today. Um, this was 
a great treat to see you guys and hear some playing and some great musical advice. So thank you all for being here. And uh, thanks to everyone that tuned in and great questions. Really appreciate you being here. Um, for anyone that's unfamiliar with who these folks are and what we do here, this is uh, ArtistWorks, and you can check it out at ArtistWorks.com. And uh, all these folks have their own online schools that you can learn directly from them. And you can also interact directly with them through video submissions where you'll get a video back with uh, personal advice for you. And uh, right now we do have a discount code running. Um, we're going to keep that open for a little while too, um, as well as the competition. So we'll be giving away some swag, some signed gear, and uh, you know some fun stuff and some free subscription time to uh, learn from any of our schools as well. So that'll be open for a couple of weeks if you catch the show after it's run. Uh, and the code is LIVE35 if you want 35% off a discount. So hope to see you all down the road. And uh, yeah, thanks. have a great Thank one, everyone. Guys. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, Thank you, everybody. Super fun. <laughs> see, see you ya. later. Bye.